Hey there, BookTube. It's Peg. I am back at the History Shelf. Um, today is a Tuesday, and in lieu of a tag, I decided to highlight many books that I recently acquired, I would say over the last couple months, maybe a little longer, um, from the U.S. Naval Institute Press. It's a fantastic press. Um, I will include the link below in the description box. Please check them out. Um, I had shelved some of these books. Actually, you see that gap down below there? <laughs> That's where they were. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? I know that a lot of my peeps out there, especially the ones that really love naval history, um, would enjoy uh, seeing this haul. And I was going to have a copy on hand of the, uh, I'm a member of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I get, uh, for that, I get, you know, member pricing on their books. I also get um, a subscription at a reduced rate f to a fantastic history magazine. And I know um, Bill Rutenberg at the Rutenberg Library might enjoy that. I um, their, their magazine is called uh, Naval History, and it's fantastic. I wish I had a copyright. They're upstairs. Um, Oh, and uh, sorry. And then I also get this. It's it's a proceedings magazine. Um, uh, so you get you get access. You can get a reduced rate for the the history magazine, and then you get a free subscription to proceedings, which is it's really interesting. Um, a lot of it's kind of technical, um, but also there's a lot of really cool stuff in here on strategy. Uh, there was a great article in here about so that uh, an officer wrote about Alfred Mann and and then how you know we should get back to his outlook on I mean, naval strategy. And in fact, a lot of these books I'm going to show you relate to Alfred Mann um, or Mahan, but I call him Alfred Mann. Um, so yeah. Oh, here it is. Yep. This is the article I wanted to show you guys. This is Going to War with China? Ignore Corbett, Dust Off Mayan. Uh, so it's good stuff. There are some really good articles um, that pertain to the layman, you know, that, that you can understand. Um, anyway, so I wanted to show you that. It's a great publishing house. They do a lot of great stuff. And you get a lot of really um, specialized titles that you wouldn't normally find on the mainstream uh, press. Uh, so having said that, um, yeah, Bill, check out, uh, check out the link below. See if you're interested in the Naval History Magazine. I am also a big subscriber to and, and longtime enthusiast of the HistoryNet family of history magazines. So I highly encourage you to check out. Uh, gosh, for years and years when I was younger, I was an America's Civil War subscriber, Civil War Times Illustrated subscriber then they switched to civil civil war times they dropped the illustrated um american history there was also uh, i think wild west i might pick up that pres that prescription that subscription again i think i'm gonna go to the bookstore this week and check out the newsstand and maybe just see what current magazines are out there but anyway you know i have a huge uh subscription base of historical magazines i try to get every single one i can there's world war ii um the only one i have not subscribed to is a vietnam war magazine that to me just seems a bit depressing i mean that any war really is but uh, i don't know what it is i think it's maybe too soon um but i am enjoying reading vietnam war history so i might check out that as well just adding to my tbr constantly Anyway, guys, so this is a, uh, we're going to call this like a, just a naval history uh, book haul, um, a double envelopment, as it were, because we've got tons of books, and um, I think a lot of these I scored through their clearance sale, they're what they call the um, clear the decks clearance sale, which is really cool, it's like 50 to 80% uh, off, on, or 90% off on a ton of different books, so let's just jump in with um, Patton, shall we? Um, oh, okay, this is one book. Oh, this one is not part of the oeuvre of uh, Naval History Press, but I think I showed this in another, it's a patent book, but this is from the University of Missouri Press, um, Battling with History. Okay, so I actually have this one situated with my Naval History uh, Press books because of the next book I got, which was definitely uh, a patent book, obviously, and this is Patton's Way, A Radical Theory of War by James Kelly Morningstar, okay? Um, and in fact, this might be, 
This is very new. Nope. And I, okay, no, I got it on sale. It's 2017. Um, James Kelly Morningstar. Uh, Patton's Way is a unique approach to the legend of General George Patton Jr. and his development and application of modern warfare. Uh, much more than a biography, Patton's Way argues that popular representations of Patton are built on misconceptions and an incomplete understanding of his approach to battle. Uh, James Kelly Morningstar addresses the contradiction between the historiographical criticism of Patton's methods and popular appreciation for his successes. The author identifies several schools of thought offering explanations, yet he notes they all fail to fully comprehend the real Patton. Uh, the Secret to Patton's Success was a radical and purposefully crafted doctrine developed over several decades. Patton's Way identifies four core principles in Patton's Creed, targeting the enemy's morale through shock, utilizing highly practiced combined arms mechanized columns relying on mission tactics and flexible command and control, and employing multi-layered and synthesized intelligence systems to identify enemy capabilities and weak spots. And all anyone can hear right now are the dogs running by me. Um, <laughs> they just came from downstairs. They're very excited. Um, anyway, so this is uh, Patton's way, a radical theory of war. We're letting the dogs out right now. Okay, so the next book I picked up... Um, it's an updated and expanded version of uh, a book I hadn't heard of before, but there's been a lot of recent books and main the, the more mainstream publishers that have come out about, I think Tower of Skulls might be, have been the most recent to talk about this, but I wanted to check out this. This is Hell to Pay, Operation Downfall and the Invasion of Japan, 1945 to 1947 by DMG and Greco. As you can see, updated and expanded so very nice paperback, U U.S. Naval Institute Press. Um, the two years before the atomic attacks in Hiroshima and Nagasaki helped bring a quick end to hostilities in the summer of 1945, uh, U.S. planners began work on Operation Downfall, codenamed for the Allied invasions of Kyushu um, and Honshu in the Japanese home islands. Hell to Pay examines the invasion of Japan in light of the large body of Japanese and American operational and tactical planning documents the author unearthed in familiar and obscure ar archives. It includes post-war interrogations and reports that senior Japanese commanders and their staffs were ordered to produce for General MacArthur's headquarters. This groundbreaking, yeah, let me try that again, this groundbreaking history counters the revisionist interpretations questioning the rationale for the use of the atomic bomb and shows that President Truman's decision was based on real estimates of the enormous human cost of a conventional invasion. This revised edition of Hell to Pay expands on several areas covered in the earlier book and deals with three new topics. Should, they should do a book about how dogs lie. That's what they should do. How dogs lie? How dogs lie. My best friend might be dog. Oh. You guys, quit telling tales out of school. All right. Um... <laughs> so the book deals with three new topics, um, U.S.-Soviet cooperation in the war against Imperial Japan, U.S.-Soviet and Japanese plans for the invasion and defense of the northernmost home island of Hokkaido, and Operation Blacklist, uh, the three-phase insertion of American occupation forces into, into Japan. So this sounds fantastic. That's why I picked it up. I'm really intrigued by the new archival sources that uh, Gian Greco is utilizing here. And um, just having three new topics of study. Um, so Gian Greco served at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College for more than 20 years. And, and for more than 20 years as an editor at Military Review. Um, and followed by work in the Foreign Military Studies Office. Uh, he's an award-winning author of numerous books on military and sociopolitical subjects. He has also written extensively for national and international publications and news agencies. Um, so, yeah, nice, full, full, uh, nice, uh, big chunk, chunkster of a book. Um, it's got some nice, um, you know, not, not overly illustrated. There's some, there's some maps in here and we've got some photos, but mostly, um, gets right down into the nitty grit, into gritty, a lot of appendices as well. So hell to pay. Ooh, now this one's going to be fantastic. 
because I've been wanting to read this for a long time. I've always been fascinated by this World War I naval battle. And this is about Jutland. And this is by one of the uh, participants, the players. This is Jutland, The Unfinished Battle by Nicholas Jellicoe. Um, yep. Sorry, he was not a participant. <laughs> he was the grandson of the participant. This is Nicholas Jellicoe. He is the grandson of Sir John Jellicoe. Okay, so so he might have a little bit of a bias here. We're going to, you know, definitely read that with the, that in mind. Robert K. Massey calls this a compelling dramatic account of the Royal Navy's last great sea battle. Okay, so let me give you a little synopsis here. More than 100 years after the Battle of Jutland, the first and largest engagement of dreadnoughts in the 20th century, historians are still fighting this controversial and misunderstood battle. What was in fact a strategic victory stands out starkly against the background of bitter public disappointment in the Royal Navy and decades of divisive uh, acrimony and uh, very public infighting between the camps supporting the two most senior commanders, Jellicoe and Beatty. This book retells the story of the battle from both a British and German perspective based on the latest research and traces the bitter dispute that ensued in the years after the smoke of war had cleared what became known as the Jutland Controversy. Uh, Nicholas Jellicoe is uniquely placed to tell this story as the grandson of Sir John Jellicoe, who commanded the Grand Fleet at Jutland and was famously, famously described by Churchill as, quote, the only man who could have lost the war in an afternoon, end quote. Oh, Winston. Widely hailed when first published, this new paperback edition has been completely revised and offers the best and most balanced account of the ba battle available and can be read alongside the author's interactive website. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll see how it balanced. I mean, you know, it's hard when you're related to someone that you're not going to really... You might pull some punches, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, it, it sounded fantastic. I think I want to get the... Uh, didn't John Jellico write a defense of his... Uh, I think I almost bought that book. I had it, and I was searching one day in a bargain place, and John Jellico... Well, let me look that up. I'll get back to you guys on that one. But um, anyway... I got that for a good deal at the time. Uh, you know, they're always having sales. You should check out their site. Go to, then there's a site where it says books, and then there's should have a little clearance site that says clear the decks. You can find some really great stuff here. Okay, so moving on to the article I showed you about in the Proceedings magazine um, about uh, Alfred Mahan. Well, these are two books that I was really excited to get. Now, this one I paid a little extra for. I really wanted this because it's a beautiful, um, it's, it's, a, it's a wider type of book. You know, it's, it's not your standard paperback size. It's, it's a nice copy. This is beautiful. This is Alfred Thayer Mahan, The Man and His Letters by Robert Seeger II. Now, look at just the, this wide uh, edition. It uh, lays flat. Um, and I've been intrigued by Mayan ever since, strangely enough, by reading fiction. I remember when I was reading the John Jake's North and South trilogy, and uh, when the recruits, um, uh, Ori Main and uh, George Hazard, were at West Point, they were talking about how um, the text that they were using. I think even at the time, um, I think in the book at the time there was he even had like a little um, walk-on spot for for Alfred Mayan or something like that, and he really stood out. Like John Jakes really made this character, uh, this professor at the time, come alive. So, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty dope. Was it Alfred Mayan or was it? Um, uh, let me let me read this first. I'm getting confused here. President Theodore Roosevelt called him one of the greatest and most useful influences in American life. He was. Indeed, in the words of the author of this biography, Mahan had much to do with resurrecting the U.S. Navy, oh, from its post-Civil War grave, and with giving it the professional ballast and theoretical direction that helped guide it to victory in 1898, in 1918, and in 1945. By many Americans, he is recalled chiefly as the author of The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. This brilliant, instantly acclaimed volume was in many ways the most influential book written by an American in the 19th century. You know, I remember, I remember 
was it John Jakes or somewhere else though, where they mentioned Mayan? And uh, anyway, I know I, I I first twigged to this guy from some type of historical fiction. So let me look into that. I don't know when when did he write the influence of sea power upon history. Oh, no. Well, listen. Okay. He was a midshipman in 1847, 1859. Um, he might have been, um, he might have been teaching at West Point in 1860 or 18, or 18. I'm going to find out. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> I know I read it somewhere. Um, and I'm pretty sure I was right. He was around and he was teaching naval, naval tactics and principles. So this is a beautiful volume. Uh, U.S. Naval Institute Press. If you want it, check it out. Go to their site. And then the next book I got is, uh, this is fantastic, and this is written, um, I guess you'd call it from the um, a Japanese perspective. This is from Mayan to Pearl Harbor, the Imperial Japanese Navy and the United States by Sadao Asada. So, um, yes, this came out in, uh, 2006. When did the man, but this is a beautiful, oh, just love that volume. Um, oh, this one's full of great tables and, um, information here. Um, okay, so the back of the book doesn't have the description, it just has a blurb, but I will try, um... Let me read something from the preface here. Uh, this is from a professor at um, Doshisha University in Kyoto. Uh, After many years of research into Japanese and American sources, I confess I am close to retirement from uh, Doshisha University in Kyoto. I offer the present essay on the Imperial Japanese Navy spanning the half century preceding Pearl Harbor. It is, of course, a saddening account of a great navy with a, tra with a tradition and authority that became alienated from and finally clashed with the navy of a neighbor separated by the 9,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, to trace the genesis of antagonism, I go back to the American ide ideologue of sea power, Alfred Thayer Mahan, his sea power doctrine and its influence on the Japanese navy. In 1906 to 1907, the two navies as if in a mirror image, began to see each other as hypothetical enemies. During a happy interlude, the Washington Conference of 1921-22, to 22, the Japanese Navy, under the charismatic leadership of Admiral Keito Tomosaburo, cooperated with the United States to dispel a war scare and frame the Washington system of, of naval limitation. Uh, what followed in Japan after Keito's untimely death in 1923 was a revolt against the Washington Naval Treaty, disintegration of the naval tradition, and degeneration of naval leadership until it virtually collapsed in 1941. I tell the story, this is what intrigues me, I tell the story from the perspective of my own country, but I have been much influenced by my long experience in the U.S., where I studied at Carleton College, and then the academic experience of my life with the late Samuel Flagg Bemis of Yale University. I was Bemis's last doctoral student before his retirement, and I shall never forget his instruction, and especially his kindnesses, which were innumerable. innumerable. Mm. He introduced me to a fine dissertation topic, and this is the topic, Japan and the United States, 1915 to 1925, centering on the Washington Conference, and this was the start of the pages that follow. So, um, fantastic. Uh, I love it. Again, you find such great uh, gems there at the U U.S. Naval Institute Press. Um, and uh, let's see, so the next stack I have were definitely all from the Clear the Decks um, sale. So hang on a second. Yeah. Get these. I've been meaning, and I've been meaning to show you, these, uh, show you these for a while. Oh, and one of them actually is brand new, so let me get to that real quick. This was sent to me. Uh, they reached out to me, um, lovely people at U.S. Naval Institute Press, and to see if I would like uh, to take a look at this as a review copy. Brand new book, and it's fascinating because I've always been intrigued by uh, undersea exploration, the technology involved. Uh, this book just came out this year. So brand new release from U.S. Naval Institute Press. 
Uh, this is opening the great depths. The Bathyscaphe, Bathyscaphe Trieste and Pioneers of Undersea Exploration by Norman Polmar and Lee J. Mathers. Um, look at that great picture. It takes a certain type of person to want to get into that and go thousands and thousands of feet into the ocean. And that would not be me. But I, am, I just applaud people and the, the courage and the, just the people that are willing to do this for science and everything else. It's just fantastic. Uh, so let me read this to you real quick. Developed by French physicist Auguste Picard and his son Jacques, the Bathyscaphe Trieste was a scientific marvel that allowed unprecedented scientific, technical, and military feats in the ocean depths. France and the United States both acquired and subsequently developed variants of the original Bathyscaphe. While both France and the United States employed the Bathyscaphe as a tool for scientific investigation of the deepest ocean depths, the U.S. Navy developed and also employed the Trieste for military missions. Um, from its earliest years, participants in the Trieste program realized that they were making history, blazing a trail into previously unexplored and unexploited depths, developing new capabilities, and opening a new frontier, all in the midst of the Cold War. Um... See, it gets into the more technological aspects of it. It's very cool. Uh, opening the Great Depths is the story of, of the three Trieste uh, deep ocean vehicles that are officers and enlisted men and the civilians, often told in their own words, documenting for the first time the earliest years of humanity's probing into Earth's final frontier. So, fantastic new release. I'm very excited to, uh, to look at this. And I will report back. Oh, so that is our, our one, yeah, the newest release from U.S. Naval Institute Press. Now I'm going to go into some of the, the really uh, great finds I found on the, the uh, clearance sale. And let's start with this one. Because it's another book in the Alfred Mann line. So I've got like three awesome books about Alfred Thayer Mann in some, some fashion or another. And this is God and Sea Power. The Influence of Religion on Alfred Thayer Mann by Susan Geisler. Suzanne Geisler. So that's an intriguing, um, it's a shorter read, but it's a really uh, narrow topic, obviously. But I think it'll, you know, um, buttress the um, other biography I just showed you and you know, kind of go into the more um, religious and, you know, the, the faith aspect of uh, Mann's life and how that influenced him, if at all. In his studies, um, since the 1890 release of his monumental *The Influence of Sea Power Upon History* (1660 to 1783), <clears throat> analysts of Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan have made an exacting study of his thoughts, naval theories, and contributions to the understanding of naval and maritime power. One vital aspect of his life, however, has been ignored or misunderstood by many scholars: his religious faith. In, in God and Sea Power, well, God and Sea Power is the first work to examine in a detailed and contextual way how Mayan's faith influenced his views on war politics and foreign relations. Uh, Mayan was a professing Christian who regarded his faith with the utmost seriousness, and his worldview was inherently Christian. Most scholars have overlooked this, though even a passing familiarity with his personal papers and his public writings makes it obvious. As a result, with few exceptions, the popular view of Mayan is largely incomplete. His Christianity, especially as he practiced it in the Episcopal Church, was not only central to his personal life, but also influenced his writings on naval and geopolitical matters. Fascinating. Um, he wrote and spoke extensively on religious topics, a point frequently ignored by many historians. Um, this is a fundamental mistake, she says, for a deeper and more accurate understanding of man as a person and as a naval theorist can be gained by an examination of his religious beliefs. Well, I'll be interested to see how that affected that. Fellow Episcopalian naval officer, real, rear, admiral, rear admiral, I don't know why those two, when the R's are so close together like that, it always messes me up. Fellow Episcopalian naval officer, rear admiral Charles H. Stockton, who had known Mayan since his own midshipman days at the Naval Academy and served under him at the Naval War College, penned a lay tribute to Mayan in the Anglican Journal Churchman. Quote, he had become an author, a thinker, an historian, and a naval statesman. But in it all, and interwoven throughout, was the earnest, sincere, and devout Christian. So, I am truly intrigued by this book. 
It's roughly, it's got some great footnotes and a bibliography that I will earnestly enjoy going through. It's less than 200 pages. Um, this came out in 2015. So, very happy to have that. Pause one moment, I need to let the little gitch stir outside, okay. Okay, the next three volumes are all by the same author, and he has even more available on the website. But I wanted to start with these, and the most famous of which, um, I'm sure everyone has heard of because it was made into a very famous movie back in the day. This is Run Silent, Run Deep. Look at this. This is a beautiful hardcover edition by Edward L. Beach. Um, just a lovely cover. I love it. That artwork is, in, is amazing. All right, so universally praised for its powerfully authentic description of submarine warfare. Run Silent, Run Deep was an immediate succe success when published in 1955 and shot to the top of bestseller list nationwide. In 1958, Hollywood adapted the novel for the big screen, starring Clark Gable and Burt Lancaster. The New York Times said of the novel, <clears throat> If ever a book had a ring of reality, this is it. Combat passages rank with the most exciting written about any branch of the service. The Saturday Review called the book a classic and many reviewers compared its author to such greats as C.S. Forrester and Eric Maria Remarque. Today, these accolades still ring true for Edward L. Beach's gripping first novel of American sub submariners confronting a formidable Japanese Navy in a vicious battle to control the Pacific. Beach's taut and dramatic narrative, told with the intimacy of a confession, uh, deals with two strong-willed men, Edward, Richard Edward Richardson, commander of the USS Walrus, and his executive officer, Jim Bledsoe. Bound together by wartime duty, the two are divided by jealousy, pride, and love for a beautiful woman. Uh, but long after the details of this famous novel fade from memory, what remains with us is a startling realization of the way it really was in the silent service during World War II. I want to give you some more information about uh, Edward L. Beach. One quick second. Okay, sorry, the dogs are very active today. They went in, they went out. So Edward Beach, he lived from 1918 to 2002. Um, he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1939 and became a decorated submariner and best-selling author. So during World War II, he par participated in the Battle of Midway and 12 additional combat patrols. Um, in his distinguished naval career, he earned the Navy Cross set a speed and endurance record with the first submerged circumnavigation of the Earth, and served as a naval aide to President Eisenhower. So that is Edward L. Beach. Now, he's written several books, and a lot of them are considered classics, along, you know, along with Run Silent, Run Deep. Um, and this one I got in a beautiful uh, hardcover, cloth-bound edition. Um, look at this. And this is Classics of Naval Literature. And this is about, this is The Wreck of the Memphis, which apparently is a um, nonfiction work, um, a true story. And it's about his father, I believe. Um, let's see here. Let me read something. from. It's a beautiful, I just love all oh, these hardcover editions that just, when they smell so wonderful and they feel so good in the hand. Um, I'll read you a little something from the introduction. This introduction was composed 31 years after the original publication of The Wreck of the Memphis. Seldom does an author get the opportunity to pen two introductory pieces to the same book, especially so many years apart. This book was first published on August 29, 1966, not coincidentally the 50th anniversary of the loss of my father's fine and favorite ship. Now it will shortly be the 82nd anniversary, and I personally plan to be still around for the 100th uh, without plans for, a yet, for yet a third introductory essay, however. Um, then he goes on to talk about there, how there have been other Navy ships named the Memphis, um, and just talks about the history of the, the ship. Uh, lessons are frequently taught... Um, let's see. 
Um, ah, I can't find the actual description here, but um, okay. Well, then we have the foreword. This is the story of a ship of the United States Navy and her people, as told by her commander and his son, and by the members of the ship's company who served in her on the 29th of August, 1916. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, this is the foreword that was written by Edward L. Beach, and uh, it's about the wreck of his father's ship, obviously, um, in 1916. So it's considered a classics of naval literature. I'm excited to read about that. And then the last Edward Beach book I have is a, comes in a Blue Jacket book edition, which is a very particular to the Naval Institute Press. Uh, they have this very fine, you know, indicator at the top, Blue Jacket books. And this is a work of fiction, He, but Edward Beach wrote a lot of different, you know, naval fiction. Um, but it looks just the kind of stuff that I love. <laughs> so this is Edward L. Beach's Dust on the Sea, a novel. Um, and in a lot of cases, if you were to look for these titles on Amazon or whatever, they have like very older editions, very old editions, but they're also like used secondhand and they can, they can cost quite a bit. But I found this wonderful blue jacket, um, reprint edition for dirt cheap. So check it out. I want to get his other, um, his other submarine novels as well. Um, he's got Dust on the Sea, The Wreck of the Memphis, which I have, Run Silent, Run Deep. And the other two books by him, I still need to get a submarine with an exclamation point and Around the World Submerged, which I think is his memoir. Uh, so Dust on the Sea was published to great acclaim in 1972 on the heels of Run Silent, Run Deep. Um, like his predecessor, this novel was launched. Um, sorry. This novel was lauded for its authentic portrayal of a submariner's life during the desperate years of World War II in the Pacific. Um, in describing the commander and crew of a, of a fictitious sub named the USS Eel as they attempt to destroy Japanese ships and save American lives, Beach treats readers to a superb blend of action and adventure, along with an authentic view of the personal agonies of war. With no margin for error, the men withstand storms, depth charges, and even hand-to-hand -hand combat to defend themselves and their boat. As the title of this book reminds us, mistakes result in a mistakes result in a streak of debris known as dust on the sea, which briefly serves as a grave marker for a sunken ship. Wow, that is very um, vivid, evocative. I never, I never knew that. They called it dust on the sea. Wow. All right. Sounds like a great read. So I've got these three books by Edward L. Beach. I'm very happy to have. Um, and then I just a ton of other great books that I've just showed you. So I'm going to reshelve these books and know that I've now done my due diligence and shown you um, these wonderful books by U.S. Naval Institute Press. I highly recommend you check out their site. Just browse, take a look around. Again, I've got this new copy of a uh, review copy of Opening the Great Depths, the Bathyscaphe Trieste, um, Pioneers of Undersea Exploration. Very excited for this as well. Great stuff from a great publisher. Uh, so uh, from th there, I will leave it there. And from there, I will continue on um, and uh, just continue cataloging these wonderful books and sharing them with you. And I'll get back to you on some of these once I uh, get through them. And uh, yeah. Check out U.S. Naval Institute Press, guys, and uh, have a great day. We'll talk soon. Bye, BookTube.